can't a girl have a mental breakdown in peace? Hi, how are you? Did you miss me? I definitely missed you. It's been a while. I am so sorry I disappeared on you. How many times have I said that? I know, huh? Yeah. 2022 kind of like kaboom. Like, wow, it really, um, my life turned upside down and I just needed a break because... <laughs> because I just needed a break because and I think that's a good enough answer and um yeah I'm excited to be back I'm excited to be here and I'm, ex I'm excited for this new chapter this new era is what I'm thinking of it as I feel good I'm happy thank you for being patient and being understanding and being supportive I appreciate you guys for like reaching out and asking if I'm if I'm okay I'm definitely okay just a bump in the road it happens in life and, um, you know, it is what it is. But I'm here now and I'm excited. Also, I was thinking about this really quick. No theme song. I'm not gonna do a theme song moving forward because I feel like this has gotta be a new era. I just gotta move forward. I don't know. The theme song just doesn't feel right right now. <laughs> I'm reclaiming my space. And I'm taking my murder mystery and makeup back. I feel like this last year I really let everybody's opinions and thoughts and comments and everything get into my head. And I kind of forgot, like, why did I do this in the first place? Because I was just trying to make everybody happy. Say the right things, do the right things, all that stuff. And I was like, wait a minute. Mm, no, I don't want to do that anymore. I want to stay true to myself, right? As one should. And... That's what I'm gonna do. I mean, just like many of you out there, I, Bailey Sarian, I too am interested in true crime and I just wanna talk about it. That's all that this is, really. Netflix has just been <laughs> making it rain so much true crime, right? Like it's getting out of control. It's just everywhere you look. It's like, whoa, 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 something new. I've come across so many stories that I wanna talk about. I'm very excited and yeah, I'm just happy to be back. I think that's mainly it. <laughs> I'm a little nasally because I had a cold, not COVID, a cold. Before we jump into today's story, we do have a sponsor and I wanna give a big thank you to Best Fiends. Hi, Best Fiends. Thank you for partnering with me on today's video. They too have been quite patient with me. They're like, hey, are you ever gonna upload? And I was like, yeah, eventually. <laughs> Anyways, if you haven't heard of Best Fiends, first off, where have you been? Best Fiends, if you don't know, is an adventure game where you solve thousands of fun puzzles and collect cute characters along the way called Fiends. I freaking love Best Fiends, it's so fun. And I think it's safe to say that I just can't stop. It's just so fun. <laughs> The thousands of fun puzzles and games keep you constantly entertained and you honestly can just get lost in playing the game for hours and hours and hours and, and it's just, I love it. I cannot stop. They also have these super cute characters um, and the more levels that you win, the more fiends you get to collect. I usually play best fiends whenever I have some downtime. Um, so like when I'm watching Golden Girls, I've been really into Golden Girls and Seinfeld. That's all I've been watching since I've been on my break, really. So I've been playing Best Fiends, laying in bed. Oh yeah, oh yeah, you know, just going off. I mean, you really can play Best Fiends whenever. I've been playing for quite some time now and it never gets old because the puzzles are constantly new and challenging. Let me tell you what level I'm on. It's ridiculous, don't judge me. I'm on level 1,486. I've obviously put some time into this game. I think that's safe to say. I'm telling you, babe, it's real fun. I'm gonna play it right now if I don't put this down. Hold on. Download the game for free using my link below to get $5 worth of gold and energy for free if you beat level five. I'm on 1,400 and what? I think you could beat level five. And remember, it's just like friends, but without the R. Best. Fiends. A big thank you to Best Fiends for partnering with me on today's episode. Let's get to today's story. I'm like extra hyper just cause I don't know. I'm just excited to be here. If you're ever curious to know what I'm using, I will list it down in the description box down below. Okay. But other than that, let's get into today's story. So 
Today's story takes place in a little town in Missouri called Independence. Yes, it's called Independence, which I guess is like an adorable little neighborhood just east of Kansas City. And back in the 1940s, Independence had around 16,000 people living there. And then in the 50s and 60s, they saw like a big boom. It was like growing a lot. And it went from 62,000 people to then like 110,000 people by the 1970s. Our story takes place in 1960 in this growing town of independence. So in this town, there lived a girl named Sharon. And growing up, friends would say, even at a young age, I guess, Sharon was always thinking about the day when she could get the hell out of this small town of independence and move to like a big city, you know? like Los Angeles or New York. And by the time Sharon was 16, she was just obsessed with reading magazines and following celebrity gossip. It was just all so glamorous to her. She just wanted a life outside of this small town, as many, as many do. The summer when Sharon was 16 years old, she met a guy named James at a church event. Now James was 22 at the time. So, you know, it's a little questionable, but okay. And he was home for the summer. I guess he ended up, you know, going to the church event and that's where he met Sharon. James was actually attending college at, um, how do you say this, Bur Birmingham? I don't even freaking, hold on. Brigham? Brigham. James was a college student at Brigham Young University and he was also studying, or he was an engineering student. So he's like, you know, smart engineering student, wow. He also grew up in Independence, but he was able to break out of the small town and move to Provo, Provo, Utah. Sharon found, you know, she found this to be very exciting. Someone who actually broke out of the small town and like moved on to do bigger things. She was like, oh my God, do me now. She was infatuated with him. And honestly, James seemed to be infatuated with Sharon as well. Isn't this cute? This is a side note. I just wanna say thank you to my friend, Jill. She got this little neon sign for me for my birthday, Christmas, birth, Christmas. It was very nice of her. That's so thoughtful. Thank you, Jill. It's just cute. So the two ended up having a summer of love smooching and stuff. But as soon as summer ended, it was time for James to go back to school. He does have to go back to school. Now he promised Sharon that he would like write her as often as he could while he was away, which he did, like he held on to that promise. Now Sharon would always get excited to see a letter from James, but not long after going back to school, James gets a letter in the mail from Sharon. And in this letter, she's telling him that she's pregnant. James was a practicing Mormon and baby girl, this is the late 1950s, getting pregnant out of wedlock as a Mormon. You better think twice, you know? Mm-mm, nay, nay. You don't do that. So the couple needed to figure out something fast and their best bet was to get married. Well, James does the quote unquote right thing and goes back to independence and marries Sharon. It happens like very quickly. And after they get married, or I think like right before, I'm not sure if it was right before, like right after, Sharon um, converts to Mormonism. She becomes Mormon. After the wedding, they both moved back to Provo, Utah, so James could finish school. So Sharon's excited because she gets out of independence. That's like everything she wants. Well, not long after moving to Provo, Utah, Sharon ends up having a miscarriage and loses the baby. There are many who have speculated if she was really pregnant or not, but who knows? The two would end up having a baby together in 1957 and they would have a daughter. Well, I guess married life, school, being a parent, it was just all becoming too much for James. And he decides it would be best if he just drops out of school. He can't, um, he just can't do it anymore. Like the stress was just really getting to him. Because James dropped out of school, they really had no reason to be in Provo, Utah anymore. So the family moves back to independence. So Sharon is like devastated, her dream of leaving, she's like, Fuck. They end up moving into a small home, which is like very close to James' parents' home, which James' parents were very strict, um, super warm, and they really didn't like Sharon. Um, she wasn't a true woman of their faith, and 
you know, they wanted the best for their son. So there's some tension. In May of 1959, the couple had a baby boy, but as time went on, their marriage was just not going very well. Sharon and James started having serious discussions about divorce. And I guess at some point, James ended up cheating on Sharon with a past lover and Sharon had found out and obviously, not a great thing to find out, your partner's having an affair, right? And because of this, they would argue a lot. But to be fair, now I don't know if James knew this, but Sharon was also doing a little something on the side, okay? She was talking to an old fling and was like hanging out with an old boyfriend that she had before she met James, but she was making James feel really bad. Do you know what I'm saying? You know when a cheater is being a cheater? and they make you feel bad for having an affair or cheating, meanwhile, they're actually cheating, that's Sharon. That's her. I think one thing that irritated Sharon the most was the fact that she really thought like she got out of independence, like she had her meal ticket out of there and then it backfired and she ended up right back there, stuck in this home next to her parent-in-law's house who didn't even like her, I mean, it's just not an ideal situation to be in. Money within the relationship was tight and this isn't like the life Sharon imagined for herself. She wanted somebody who was financially stable and again, she wanted to move out of town. Sharon told James that she would be happy to get a divorce only if she got custody of their two children, got the house, and also got $1,000 cash. The cash was to help financially until she could like find a job of her own. So James is kind of, um, I guess he's, you know, he's unsure of what the right thing to do is. So he goes to his parents and he tells them what's going on and he's looking for some kind of advice, right? Um, what should I do? Like, should I get a divorce? She's unhappy, blah, blah, blah. Well. His parents told James that divorce wouldn't be an option and that the two needed to work it out. They needed to fix the marriage because most of all, like divorce was just really not okay within their belief system. So they are highly suggesting that they work it out. James listens to his parents and he goes back to Sharon, tells her that he doesn't want a divorce. He wants to work on it. And so they did. But as time went on, the marriage was not getting better. Well, now it's March of 1960. James and Sharon's daughter was almost three years old and their son was about 10 months old. Great. So on March 19th, 1960, Sharon went into her bathroom to get ready for, I guess, like a church dinner that they were heading to. And James, he was feeling a little tired and he wanted to take like a quick little power nap before they went to this dinner. So he lays down on the bed and the bathroom was like right there, right? Cause it's the master bathroom, bedroom. Great. So he decides to lay down, take a nap. Sharon said that she was in the bathroom getting ready when she hears her daughter who's three years old, walking into the bedroom. And she goes up to her dad, James, and says, Daddy, how does, this, how does this thing work? And then Sharon says she hears a kaboom or a bang, I should say, bang. Sharon is like, what the fuck? Like she hears a loud bang. So she runs out of the bathroom and she saw that James is bleeding from his head in the bed and their daughter was standing next to him with a gun lying on the pillow. Sharon, she recognizes the gun. It's James's 22 caliber pistol. Now their daughter and friends and family can confirm this. Their daughter had toy guns of her own that she always played with. And Sharon thought that maybe her daughter thought like, oh my God, this was one of her toys, but it was a real gun. James was shot in the back of the head, which showed that he didn't do it himself. And according to Sharon, their daughter was the only one in the room. Mind you, again, she was three years old. Killer baby on the loose, you know, like, holy shit. James sadly was pronounced dead at the scene and he was only 25 years old. So police come out and they question Sharon, like, you know, they have to, what, what happened? Now it was reported that Sharon was like very upset. She could barely talk. She seemed like traumatized. They could tell she was upset. You know what I'm saying? Like they were like, okay, if you're guilty of something, you don't act like that. 
Police try to question the three-year-old daughter. Okay, I'm sorry. I believe the daughter was two years old, not three years old. It's gotta be two years old. I'm sorry. She's two years old. <sighs> Please forgive me. So police try to question the daughter. I mean, she's two years old. So they try to question her as much as she could. Um, there's not much information that she can give them. She could talk and like give basic answers, but not anything in like super great detail. So after questioning the two, police decided not to do a gunshot residue test on the two-year-old or Sharon because they didn't wanna subject them to it. I know, now this would be a very big mistake. Doing a gunshot residue test was not as easy as it is today. It was a very lengthy process back then and police felt like it could further upset the family who was obviously very traumatized by this horrific accident. The lead investigator on the case did have some questions though. Like he was kind of a little like, mm, I don't know, you know? He wondered if a two year old could really pull, pull a trigger at her size. I mean, where are the odds that she could pull the trigger right at his head like holding it up and everything. Like, did she even have the strength to pull the trigger? So the department, they wanted to test their theory and see like if it's true, if it's possible. So they ended up bringing the daughter back in for questioning. And this was like days later. And they ended up putting an unloaded 22 in front of the daughter. And they told her to pick up and play with it. Which is not funny, but it's just kind of like a, you know, I don't know. It just is weird when you think about it. Like play with this gun. Let's see what she does. Well, I guess the daughter did pick up the gun a few times, um, but she did not pull the trigger. So it really didn't even answer their question. So the lead investigator ran more tests to see if a two-year-old could pull a trigger. But unfortunately, they could not get a solid answer. So um, the theory that they could come up with was that the daughter must have climbed into the bed, asked her dad how to use the gun, and then maybe the body weight may have set, set the gun off. And that's the only reasoning the investigators could come up with. Well, it turns out James had a life insurance policy. Oh. Funny, huh? Now I know you're gonna think this, you've got this whole story figured out, but <laughs> let me tell you, this is the stupidest, wildest story. So James had a life insurance policy on him, right? The policy was worth $250,000, which is very odd because James was only 25 at the time. Why would he need such a high life insurance policy? Nobody needs that much in, at 25. Interesting. Well, Sharon had collected that money about a month after James's death. Now investigators and people in town, they kind of kept their eye on Sharon. They didn't have any evidence that it was like a murder or anything, right? They had nothing on her really, but everybody was kind of just really watching her. After she received that insurance money, Sharon was spotted at a car dealership, like buying her dream car, which was a blue Ford Thunderbird. And you know, a lot of people thought, mm, that's kind of weird. The car salesman was a 23 year old named Walt. Now Walt over here was also married with two kids of his own, but Sharon found Walt to be just a total babe. And the two would end up having an affair. Oh dear, I need more concealer. This is too natural for me. There we go. Yes, yes. A month since meeting Sharon, Walt goes to the police to report his wife, Patricia, as missing. Ah, weird. He tells police that two nights ago, the couple had a fight, him and Patricia, they had a fight, and then the next day she didn't come home from work. So he asked Patricia's coworkers, like, have you seen her? She didn't come home, what's going on? And Patricia's coworkers said that after work, they noticed that Patricia went up to like talk with a woman that was in a light colored Chevy that had pulled up by her work and like Patricia went straight to the the light color Chevy. Patricia told coworkers that she was gonna get a ride from this person, so like, don't wait up for her, whatever. Interesting, right? Great. Now, at the time, Walt, the husband, he figured like, maybe she's just trying to not come home because they had a pretty heavy argument and she just needed some time to like cool off and go somewhere with a friend. But once Walt had found out about the car, 
he got that really like funky feeling. He knew something wasn't right because Walt knew that Sharon, her father's car was a, also a light colored Chevy. No oh, shit. Sharon, mind you, uh, Walt is telling all of this to the police. So before going to the police, Walt calls up Sharon and he's like, was that you? Did you go up to Patricia? Like, come on, I know that's your car. What the hell's going on? Now Sharon confesses to Walt that yes, it, it was her. And she said that she told Patricia that her sister, Sharon's sister, was having an affair with Walt and that she thought Patricia should know about this affair. Side note, Sharon doesn't have a sister. So she's being that bitch like, my friend told me that they're having an affair. You get, you get it. You get this game. Sharon tells Walt that the two of them went for a drive to talk about this affair. Then she drove Patricia home, but she dropped her off about a block from Patricia's house. Sure. Sharon tells Walt that it's it was so funny because like after dropping Patricia off, Patricia off, I'm sorry, I'm getting tongue tied. She saw her walk up to a green car that a man was driving and she started talking to that person. But Sharon just reassured Walt that she was probably just angry and hurt, but off somewhere just like cooling down and trying to get her mind off of, I don't know, the affair. So I guess when Patricia didn't show up for work the next day, that's when Walt got like really upset and he went to Sharon's house and he confronted her and was like, I know that you did something to Patricia. And then he's like, thre he threatens her with a knife and he's asking her, what did you do with my wife? But she doesn't give any answer. And Walt tells police this, like I threatened her with a knife and I know she did something to my wife. What a rhyme. Later on, information would come out that the night Walt and his wife Patricia got into the fight, Walt had tried to like break it off with Sharon hours before. And he was like, look, I'm done with you. I just, I wanna work on my marriage, blah, blah, blah. Sharon told him that she was pregnant and demanded that he leave Patricia for her. Now, Walt wanted nothing to do with Sharon and did not even believe that she was pregnant. So naturally, Walt believed that Sharon told Patricia about the affair as revenge. So after reporting Patricia as missing and telling police this whole story, several hours later, a man named John Blades calls the police from a gas station. So this John guy calls the police station and he tells them that um, he had been out in like an area in Independence near an abandoned farm where he found the body of a woman. Oh my God, yeah. What? I kind of, this is a side note, but I'm just like randomly thinking. I say it so casually like, oh, he found a body of a woman, but could you imagine just like minding your own business and you come across a body? That would be fucked up. That'd probably fuck you up for a long time. You're like, wow, I'm having a really great day. Body. I mean, I get upset when I see like roadkill. So the spot where this body was found was also known as like the town's lover's lane, you know, where like people would go and make out or like hook up, you know? Yeah, there was a body out there. So I saw good. Police meet up with this John guy, right? And he told police that he was driving in the area. You know, he was on this long drive and all of a sudden he has to go potty. So he pulls over and he walks over into the area, this area where it's like lover's lane. And that's where he spots the body. Now, when police were out there with him, they find a purse that was close by. And in this purse, there was an ID card. It was 23 year old Patricia Jones. Upon further investigation, Patricia was shot in the head, shoulder, and abs. Now police could tell that this, this shot, it was done at a close range and whoever did it tried their best to make it look like a sexual assault had also taken place, but it was determined that that was a lie. There were no physical signs of sexual assault, but the whoever did it tried to make it look like there was. 
naturally police are looking at this John guy as their main suspect because Lover's Lane, like the area where people went and where the body was found, it was kind of like, it was quite a walk from the main road. So it's like, if you have to go to the bathroom, why are you walking way out there to go to the bathroom? Like it didn't make sense to them. So John is feeling the heat and he confesses. Well, he doesn't confess. He admits that he went to Lover's Lane with his girlfriend when they spotted something in the grass. Now the girlfriend that John was with, she didn't want to be involved. So she was like, please take me home before you go to police. Like she was really spooked, I guess. So he did that and then made up the story about going to the bathroom. So police felt like this story could be true, but again, they were like, hmm. Something still doesn't make sense. Like something isn't right with this John guy. So police keep pushing for more information and John eventually cracks again. John confesses that he was out there actually looking for Patricia. So I guess like news had gotten out around town that Patricia was missing, right? So John said that his girlfriend um, had suggested or like made a comment that she was probably out there in the lover's lane area with like another man to get back at her husband, which is like, how do you know all that? She, John's girlfriend, told John that they should go out there and look for her because they were like really good friends. So they drove around and then not long after, that's when they found the, they found the body. So police are like, well, who the hell is your girlfriend? Like, how does she know all this? John's girlfriend, Sharon. Yeah, this girl gets around. John's girlfriend was Sharon. Girl, what are you doing? First of all, she has so many boyfriends, this girl. So police are putting together these pieces. They're like, oh, Sharon was the last one to see Patricia. And now she's like the first one to find the body. Interesting information. What are the odds of that, huh? Sharon was brought in for questioning and they asked her, Walt and John to take a polygraph test. Walt and John, agreed and I guess they passed the polygraph test no problem. Sharon, she refused. She didn't want to take the polygraph test, which is fine because we all know, or I hope we all know that polygraph tests are not reliable, but you know, the fact that she doesn't want to take it is like more suspicious. Now Sharon tells police that this John guy was the one who was insisting that they go to that location and look for Patricia, not her. Why is he blaming me? I don't know anything. So while they're questioning Sharon, police are also at her home searching her home, right? Okay. So while they're searching her house, they come across a gun box for a 22, but it was empty. Sharon said that she bought that gun to replace the one that killed her husband because police ended up keeping that one and she didn't have it. So she needed to buy one. So she did. Sharon tells police that she bought this gun and she purchased it two weeks before Patricia's murder. And they're like, so where's the gun now? Because it's not in the box. Sharon's like, I don't know. I lost it two days after purchasing it. She just lost it. That was her excuse. Another mistake was made and no autopsy was performed on Patricia's body because the funeral home messed up and they picked up the body before they could do an autopsy. It was some kind of mix up. And then the they realized that they made this mistake and then they sent the body back, but they had already embalmed and washed the body. So like there was no point in doing an autopsy because all of the evidence or information they needed had been washed away and just gone, not available. Sharon was arrested on May 31st, 1960, and she was being charged with the murder of Patricia. And also she was getting charged with the murder of her husband, James Kinney. But to be fair, they really didn't have any evidence. Now I know what you're thinking. You're ready to pack up and leave right now. You're like, okay, that's the story. Wow, the end. No. Stay put because look, so right before her trial, Sharon was pregnant. She told people that it was James's baby, her husband, 
But um, uh, like the timeline, it didn't make sense, okay? People guessed that it was perhaps Walt's baby because James had been dead for quite some time. But because she was pregnant, um, her trial did get pushed. A year later, it was finally held. So Sharon's team during the trial uh, had pointed out that this whole case was built against Sharon simply because investigators found the same gun box at Sharon's house because they still haven't found a murder weapon. And also Patricia his body didn't have an autopsy done, so there's no time of death that could be determined. Sharon's team would focus on the fact that, you know, Patricia could have died like on Thursday or Saturday or Sunday. I mean, who knows? We just don't know. She could have shot herself for all we know. Well, Miss Sharon had spent her money on a good defense team and it paid off because Sharon was found not guilty when it came to the death of Patricia. And it was said that the people in court actually cheered, like they were happy that she was found not guilty because they felt bad for her that she was being blamed for all of this when, you know, it wasn't her at all. People were cheering and I guess like members of the jury were asking for her autograph. So next up was the murder trial for her husband. So remember John, the boyfriend who helped, who, who found the body with Miss Sharon? Well, he started cracking at the seams. Police were putting pressure on him, you know, say something because they knew that he knew something. So police would end up getting John to crack a little bit more. John tells police that Sharon had approached him and asked if he would kill her husband, James, and she would pay him $1,000. Now this was back when he was still alive. I guess she was talking to this John guy. She was busy. I don't know how she had the time, but she asked him if he would kill James. And John was like, no, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna kill him for $1,000. That's a rip off. First of all, I am worth more than that. James is worth more than that. Okay, so John tells her no. And then she asked him, do you know anyone who will kill him? He tells police that this had happened two weeks before James was killed. So police are like, oh my gosh, like we need you to, you know, take the stand at trial and, and tell, tell everyone this. So in order to prove that Sharon sucks, police set up a plan to catch Sharon on tape, confessing to the $1,000 that she had offered to John. They need to catch on tape Sharon mentioning that this actually happened. So John gets her in his car and he's trying to be like, hey, remember that time you asked me to kill James for a thousand dollars? Like he's trying to get her to say it because there's police officers in the back of his car hiding, like in the back seat, hiding and recording the conversation. Now you're probably thinking, what the hell is this freaking circus? Okay, this is the 1960s, so I guess they couldn't just put like a little recorder in the car. This was back when like someone had to operate the recorder. So some, a police officer is hiding in the back with the recorder, like, trying not to get caught. Meanwhile, John and Sharon are in the front, like having this conversation. He's like, oh. And he's trying to get her to confess or at least mention that she had said this to him. But unfortunately, after driving around for quite some time, they could not get her to confess to this. They're like, fuck, you know? All they can do is have John testify against Sharon and just hope for the best. Okay, stay with me because it's about to get real messy. So the trial ends up taking place two years later. So in court, James, the husband who was shot by the two-year-old, James's parents actually stood by and supported Sharon agreeing that it was definitely the baby who killed their son. Now this, I guess, was all for show. I don't think they really believed this, but Sharon was threatening to like hide the kids from uh, James's parents if she didn't, if they didn't support her. So John does end up testifying against Sharon. And after five hours of deliberation, 22 year old, yeah, she's young. 22 year old Sharon was found guilty and sentenced to life. Yay, right? But don't get comfortable because this does not last long. So Sharon would end up appealing her conviction and it would be overturned 18 months later. It turns into just like this big shit show from here. Her next trial would end in a mistrial because really the only evidence they have is John's word. John, yeah, 
I think his name is John. I'm getting everybody real confused right now. Her next trial would end in a mistrial. Then her third trial ended with a hung jury. Her next trial was set for October of 1964. Okay, so October 1964. So Sharon's free, she's out doing her thing. And people really don't know where she went. She just kind of like disappeared. So Sharon's just kind of like off the grid. She's laying low, I guess. Then she appears, she appears in Mexico. In September of 1964, this is a month before she's supposed to go to trial again. She's in Mexico. She gets arrested for murder. Mm-hmm. So Miss Sharon had left the kids with her in-laws and took off to Mexico with her new boyfriend. Yeah, she gets boyfriends like boom, boom, boom. She's got like beer flavored nipples or something. She got something special, this one. So while she's there, she took on a new name. She gets a new name for herself. She starts going by Jeanette, but it, we're just gonna call her Sharon, right? So Sharon would say that they were only in Mexico to get married, not because like they were attempting to run away or anything. They were there to get married, but many speculate that that is most likely not true. Sharon said the first day in Mexico, the couple had gotten a stomach virus and they were stuck in the hotel room for a few days. Then Sharon allegedly left the room to get medicine at a local pharmacy. And then when she got there, oh no, the pharmacy was closed. She's like, what do I do now? What do I do? the pharmacy is closed. She sees that there's a local bar nearby and she's like, I'm gonna go there instead. So she goes to the local bar to hang out and get a drink, I guess. A different kind of medicine. So I guess while she is out doing her thing at this uh, bar, she also brought a gun with her for protection, right? Uh, that's what she said. And while she's there, I guess a man approaches her in the bar buys her a drink, and then invites Sharon back to his hotel room. And she's like, okay, I'll go. So while she's there, she says a man approaches her, buys her a drink, and then invites her to the, his hotel room. Now at 3 a.m., the hotel clerk heard a gunshot coming from, from this man's room. When the hotel clerk ran into the room, right, the man was on the bed, there's like blood around, and Sharon was in the bathroom seeming to like count money. When Sharon realizes that someone had come into the room, she picks up a gun and shoots at the hotel clerk, which did hit him in the arm, but he was okay. After shooting, Sharon tried to run away, but luckily Sharon was caught, arrested and charged with murder in Mexico, where she swore up and down that she shot in self-defense. Now, when police searched Sharon's hotel room, they found money, guns, fake IDs, ammo, and it looked like the couple had packed for like a very long trip, not like a quick little trip to get married. It looked like they were on the run. Police sent the bullets back to police in Independence where they were able to match the bullets to Patricia's murder. Now, unfortunately, there's double jeopardy laws which prevent her, Sharon, from being tried again for Patricia's murder. The bullets matched up, everything's pointing to Sharon, right? Great. In Mexico. Sharon was tried and convicted. Now she did receive a 10 year sentence, which she then tried to appeal. And it's funny because it ended up backfiring on her. You see, she appealed, it went back to court, and then they realized like, oh, we were actually way too nice. And they added an extra three years on top of her sentence. After her 13 year sentence, Sharon would be deported back to the States and arrested there. Oh, because she had to do the trial for her husband's murder. Okay but, and you think this is the end, but let me tell you, let me tell you, get ready. On December 7th, 1969, at around 2 a.m., police were alerted that Sharon had escaped prison. She's gone, bitch. The guards were all questioned to see like, were you working with Sharon? Because what are the odds that she would successfully escape? Literally slim to numb, none. Like there's no way she could have escaped unless she had help. And unfortunately, no answers were found. I don't know what this Sharon girl had, but she had something, she used it in her favor. It's been 53 years since Sharon was seen last and she's never been found since. The end. Can you, um, what?
She just, she got away. That's it. She got away. That's it. Story's over. I have nothing else to say. If you're watching this, Sharon, bitch, girl, what the fuck? She murdered three people and got away with it. And she started a whole new life somewhere, probably in Mexico, we don't know. She's probably killed more people, why not? She's gotten away with, <sighs> mind blowing, mind blowing. When I read this story, I was like, <laughs> I was just, it's just, huh? Anyways, that's today's story about Sharon Kinney and how she got away with killing three people and hasn't been seen since. What a little bitch. Wouldn't that be funny if she was watching? I'm like, hey Sharon. Hey. I would love to hear your guys' thoughts down below if you have any, maybe you've seen Sharon. I don't know. If you have, turn her ass in. Fucking murderer. She blamed her child for killing her husband. Like that's fucked up. She's like, yeah, the baby did it. <laughs> and she got away with it. Like that's wild. Let me know down below in the comment section who you want me to talk about next week. Even though I kind of already know who I want to talk about next week. <laughs> but other than that, I love and appreciate you so much. I hope you have a great day today. Please make good choices. Be safe out there. And I'm happy to be here. I'll be seeing you guys later.